Amen. Yeah. The subject we have before us this afternoon is one that appeared in an amended list of topics and it has to do with knowing the mind of lo the Lord in our lives. And it's also connected with a topic that has been on the list for quite some time, and that is how to have a closer walk with the Lord. We might start out by saying that today, most of us, especially in Western countries, but in almost any country, we live in what we might call the information age. To get some idea of how much information we process, it has been estimated that the average individual engaged in the business world in today's modern world and it doesn't, does not much matter which country we're in, anybody that is engaged in business in the modern world probably processes more information in one week than most people 150 years ago processed in an entire lifetime. It's hard to put ourselves into the position of people during most of the world's history, before the days of widespread newspapers, radio, telegraph, and more recently, television, the internet, the telephone, and everything we have at our disposal in the modern world. But we have to remember that in order to have the mind of the Lord, it's not simply to have information. Today, we can find out almost anything by getting on our computers, going to Google, and putting in our question. And within a matter of seconds, all kinds of information turns up. But to have the mind of the Lord is totally different. As I've said before, and I say it again, we cannot simply, to not to be irreverent, but to make the point, we cannot simply Google the Lord and expect to get all the answers to the questions that we have in our lives. Let's turn to a few verses, some of them in the Old Testament, that bring before us the need to have a relationship with the Lord in order to know his mind. Turn first of all to Psalm 25. <clears throat> Psalm 25. And here we find in verse uh, 14, Psalm 25, verse 14, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Now that's Old Testament terminology, but it makes the point. Turn over now to the book of Proverbs, to Proverbs 3. I think it's 3. Proverbs 3. And there we find in verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and notice the last part of the verse, lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. 
And then verse 7 says, Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil, and so on. And then one more verse in Jeremiah chapter 10, book of Jeremiah. <clears throat> Jeremiah 10 and verse 23. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. <clears throat> Some years ago, I read a book, a very interesting book, written by a man whom I, be whom I believe knew the Lord and was a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was taking up this very question of knowing the mind of the Lord. And he ended up by saying that what the Lord wants us to do is use the good head that he put on our shoulders to look at all the situation in our own, in our own mind, look at all the angles to it, make a good judgment about what we ought to do, then go to the Word of God and make sure that nothing we have decided is contrary to the Word of God. And if not, then, as he said, go for it. And I have to say that I have never seen a book that was so cleverly written that was so seriously wrong. Did he use some scriptures? Yes, he did. But in almost every case, they were misapplied. And the whole emphasis tended to be on, the Lord gave you a good mind, make use of it. <clears throat> now the Lord has given us, in many cases, good minds. Not everyone has a perfect mind. There are those that are born with mental challenges, and we understand that. But for most of us, we have a good mind, and this man's idea was use that. And it is true that the Lord wants us to use our minds in the right way. He gave them to us. He gave us intelligence, and he wants us to use our minds. However, we have to recognize that in the human heart and in our minds, everything has been spoiled by sin. And that, in my judgment, was what this man who wrote the book did not understand and would not face. And as a result, he went seriously wrong, trying to think that somehow we could steer our own course in this world, and as long as it didn't run directly contrary to anything in the Word of God, we were to make up our own minds about which way we were to go and what we were to do. I say that very clearly, that is totally wrong, and the scriptures we have already read, even in the Old Testament, before they had the full understanding that you and I have of the mind of God, before they were indwelt on an ongoing basis with the Spirit of God, God made it very clear that they could not and should not try to walk in their own intelligence. And there are cases in the Word of God. We won't turn to them because we don't have the time but we'll refer to one or two. What happened in the Old Testament when Abraham went down to Egypt without consulting the Lord? He got into trouble and difficulty there. Because he was in a situation where he should not have been, he told lies about who his wife Sarah was, 
telling people that she was his sister instead of making it clear that he was his wife. He also introduced his nephew Lot to all the good things of Egypt so that when it came time for Egypt, for, excuse me, <clears throat> When it came time for Abraham and Lot to have to separate, we find that Lot cast his eyes on the well-watered plains of Jordan down by Sodom and Gomorrah and made a serious mistake. He went where natural intelligence would have taken him, but where the mind of God would not go. Later on in the history of the children of Israel, we find that there were, they were engaged in conquering the land of Canaan. And we find that, of course, with the Lord was with them, and they were very successful. But we find that there were those who came up to, Mo, to Joshua and others, and they pretended to be from a far country. They were a people who had, in fact, lived very close there. They were the neighbors of uh, many of those in the land of Canaan. But they pretended that they'd come from a far country. They had put on old clothes and old shoes. They had old moldy bread with them and all the rest of it. And they were the Gibeonites from Gibeon. And... Again, what happened? Without consulting the Lord, Joshua used his own judgment and made an agreement with them. And it was a trouble and a problem to the children of Israel for many years to come. These Gibeonites had used deceit. And if Joshua had consulted with the Lord, the Lord could have revealed that to him, but Joshua didn't consult with the Lord. <clears throat> what happened in David's life? We find there was a time or two in David's life when he did something without consulting the Lord, and it did not work out well. And David learned his lesson, and ever after that, we find David was a man of prayer, a man who constantly went to the Lord and said, Lord, what shall I do now? How shall I go ahead with this? Shall I go ahead against the enemy or shall I not? How shall I do it? And so on. And we find that in every case, the Lord gave him specific instruction and he won the victory. And so we find that you and I, as believers, are not capable of charting our own course, nor can we expect to have the mind of the Lord. And here is a very important point. And pardon my making this point very clear, but if you get nothing else out of today's talk, get this. <clears throat> We cannot talk about having the mind of the Lord about a particular situation in our lives without bringing our state of soul into the picture. May I repeat that? We cannot talk about having the mind of the Lord concerning a particular situation in our life without bringing our state of soul into the picture. And that is why it says in Psalm 25, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. In simple terms, we're now this is a meeting for Christians. As an unbeliever, I cannot even think of seeking the mind of the Lord because I don't yet know the Lord or have a relationship with him. So this is for Christians. But if I, as a Christian, am walking 
at a distance from the Lord, walking carelessly, walking in a worldly way, allowing things in my life that I know are not pleasing to the Lord. And in that sense, I'm not walking in fellowship with the Lord. I cannot suddenly come to the Lord and say, Oh, Lord, help me. I have a situation here and I need some help. The Lord is not going immediately to respond to that call. No, I have, first of all, to address my relationship with the Lord and the fact that I am not walking in a way that is pleasing to him. To find out how that panned out, let's turn over to the New Testament, to Matthew's Gospel, and here we find that something happened. <clears throat> we find in Matthew chapter 26 that the Lord Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives by the chief priests and scribes who were led there by Judas Iscariot. And of course, the Lord was there and they were able to find him, and the disciples were there too. And they arrested the Lord Jesus. But what happened? Matthew 26 and verse 58. What does it say about Peter? But Peter followed him, that is the Lord Jesus, afar off. <clears throat> Poor Peter. He really loved the Lord and he wanted to please the Lord and he was willing, I believe, in his heart to go with the Lord, but he didn't realize his own weakness. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he and the other disciples had been sleeping when they should have been praying with the Lord Jesus. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter was very quick to defend the Lord. He pulled out his sword and took, a, took after one of the servants of the high priest and cut off his ear. But now we find Peter following afar off. And what happens in that situation? Poor Peter ends up denying the Lord in a most disgraceful way. I say to you and to me, let's not point the finger. <clears throat> you and I could do the same thing if we're not walking with the Lord. And so whenever it comes to our hearts as a question about something in our lives, if we go to the Lord about it, we will very, very quickly find out whether or not we are in communion with the Lord or not. Let me use an illustration. There was a dear man that lived in our area many, many years ago, and I never knew him, but I knew of him, and those who were older than I could talk about him because they did know him. And it is recorded that one day, he knelt down at his bedside at the end of the day to pray. And he found he could not pray properly. Somehow there was something wrong. Somehow there was something between him and the Lord. At first he didn't remember anything that he had done that day. But he cast about in his mind and in his soul as to what it could be. And then suddenly the Lord brought to his attention that he had had a sharp word with someone earlier in that day about something. I have no idea what it was, and it doesn't matter. But he was very sensitive to his relationship with the Lord. He confessed that to the Lord as sin. 
and once again. Once he'd confessed that sin, we find that the Lord, according to 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Once again, he was free to pray free to go to the Lord without any hindrance, <clears throat> to unburden his heart, to bring his desires before the Lord and the things that he wanted and the things for which he was thankful. <clears throat> if we want to get anything clear, and again, I have said this before, if we want to see straight on any problem in our lives or any question, bring Christ in. What did the Lord Jesus do? Bring him in and see what he did. And in order to see that, let's turn over this time to Luke's Gospel Luke's gospel. Well, maybe not. Maybe we'll go back there first. Let's turn first of all to John's gospel. Maybe we'll turn to John first. John's gospel, chapter 11. Here we have, and we say it with all reverence, a situation in the life of the Lord Jesus. And if we could say it with all reverence, he might well have been, as we say in English, in a quandary as to, be, as to knowing what to do. Because there were very good reasons to go in one direction, and very good reasons to go in another direction. Notice what happened here. John 11 and verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, a town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. We know from other scriptures that the Lord Jesus probably felt more at home in the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus than in any other place during his whole three and a half years of ministry. Here was a home where they understood him, where they loved him, where there was, especially with Mary, a real intelligence and a desire to hear his word. Probably, in Mary's case, even more than the disciples. Here was a family that loved the Lord in a wonderful way. They were evidently young. Where their parents were, we are not sure. There is no record of their being in the picture. But they lived here in a place called Bethany, which wasn't that far away from Jerusalem, probably in our language about two miles from Jerusalem, not very far. It was up over the top of the Mount of Olives, so that in order to get to Bethany, you had to walk east out of Jerusalem, down into the Kidron Valley, over the brook Kidron, up into the Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives, past the Mount of Olives, and over the top, and there was Bethany on the road east, which if you followed it, all the way, you would end up going a long way downhill to the city of Jericho by the Jordan River. <clears throat> and the Lord loved to go to Bethany, and he loved Mary and 
Martha and Lazarus. And notice that it says in verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. We can only imagine, if we could say it this way, the tug on the heart of the Lord Jesus when he received that message. It was almost, if you could say it without any irreverence, it was almost as if it were family calling him. It would be almost as if you or I got a message from a member of our close family saying, your brother is sick, your cousin is sick, your father is seriously ill, your uncle is sick, or someone like that that would be very near and dear to you. But what happens here? Verse 6. Now when he had heard therefore that he was sick, he, that is the Lord Jesus, abode two days still in the same place where he was. Now remember at this point, the Lord Jesus was not down in the south of Israel in Judea. He was in Galilee, up in Galilee. And he didn't go down there, if I may be again reverent, by jumping into a horse and buggy. I suppose it's not unusual to think that perhaps the Lord Jesus at times was able to travel in that way. But it is not recorded for us. It seems the Lord, for the most part, went on foot. So from Galilee down to Bethany was not something he could do instantaneously, but he stays two days where he is. <clears throat> then what happens? Verse 7. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late stopped, sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Here was a good reason not to go down there. Lord, are you going down to Judea again? You remember last time you were down there, they were trying to stone you. Are you going to expose yourself to that risk again? Now what to do? On the one hand, here's Lazarus down there, seriously ill, and his sisters send a message to the Lord telling him about it. They don't ask the Lord to come. They just depended on his affections. On the other hand, the last time he was there, there was a threat on his life. What would you and I do? If I can say it, it would be kind of hard to make a decision, wouldn't it? How do you use your natural intelligence in a situation like that? How do you look at all the circumstances and say, well, I guess I'll do this or I guess I'll do that? There's a serious problem, no matter which way you go. Notice the beautiful answer the Lord gives. Verse 9, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. <laughs> what was the Lord Jesus really saying? Oh, he was saying, I don't walk in the dark where every little circumstance tends to push me this way and that way or the other way. Oh no, he says, I walk in the perfect light. I have guidance. How did the Lord walk? By the light of the presence of God his Father and in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
The Lord Jesus was the first man in this world to be permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit came down upon him like a dove and rested upon him, and everything he did was in the power of the Holy Spirit. He had direct guidance from the Lord. It wasn't a question of saying, well, let me see now if I go down to, to, to Bethany, I can be there for Lazarus and deal with that situation. But I'll expose myself to being stoned. But if I stay up here in Galilee and save myself from that threat, then what about poor Lazarus? He doesn't have to weigh all those things. He simply says, Father, what is thy will? And I say that to each one of us. That is the proper way to have the mind of the Lord. But that brings us to another point, and that is to be able to have that kind of guidance depends on a close walk with the Lord. And we might say, none but the Lord did it perfectly. Turn over, for example, to the book of the Acts to see how Paul and Silas were guided. They had a situation, too, where they didn't know which way to turn. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. <clears throat> And verse 6, Acts 16 and verse 6. Here's Paul and Silas, and they had visited around in different places. They'd been in the first verse of the chapter to places called Derby and Lystra and so on. But now here they are in verse 6, and it says, and when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. We say it with all reverence. You never read of that in the life of the Lord Jesus. You never read of his making an attempt to go in a certain direction and the Spirit having to say to him, no, not that way. The Lord was always living in perfect communion with his Father and was always perfectly guided by the Holy Spirit. Even the great Apostle Paul was not always perfectly guided, but he was sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading. And what do we find here? They evidently were, were thinking to go to preach the word in Asia. But what happens? The Holy Spirit says, no, don't go there. Well, okay. Paul and Silas go in a different direction. Verse 7, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed, that simply means they tried to go into Bithynia. What happens? Once again, it says, but the Spirit suffered them not. The Spirit said, no, don't go that way either. But still no direct guidance. Well, they passed by Mysia, according to verse 8, and they came down to Troas, <clears throat> Troy. And then in verse 9, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Were Paul and Silas not walking with the Lord? I don't believe we can say that. But sometimes... 
And I don't point the finger at Paul and Silas, but sometimes we like to be active in the work of the Lord. And if we get on a roll, so to speak, using an English expression, on a roll, we like to keep going. And here we find Paul and Silas trying to go in two different directions and the Spirit saying, first of all, no, don't go that way. The second time with Mysia, no, don't go that way. And so they pass by Mysia and it's not until they come down to Troas and they're waiting there that the Spirit gives them guidance. The Lord could have showed them sooner, but sometimes we simply have to be quiet and wait. Sometimes we simply have to st sit still. Turn back again to the book of Psalms. Psalm, I think it's Psalm 46. <clears throat> And this is an important psalm for all of us. Psalm 46 and verse, hmm, verse 10, Psalm 46 and verse 10, first part of the verse. Be still and know that I am God. <clears throat> I remember well a young brother approached me once and he told me about an illustration that had been given to him by another brother in Christ who was older than he concerning how to know the mind of the Lord if you're not sure of which way to go. And this older brother, and he wasn't gathered to the Lord's name, the older brother. I did not know him. But the older person said to him, well, it's a bit like a car. Some of us are old enough to remember cars that didn't have power steering. All of the cars when I was a boy had manual steering, no power steering. And even after I learned to drive, most of the cars I drove did not have power steering. And as a result, it was very difficult to turn the wheels unless the car was in motion. Nowadays, with power steering, you just start turning the steering wheel and the power steering assists you, and you can turn even if the car is standing still. That is, as long as the motor is running. But in those days, it took real muscle, and some of the older ones here can relate to that, to turn the wheel, that is, the steering wheel, when the car was standing still before the days of power steering. And this brother told my young friend, he said, get the car going and at least start going somewhere. And then you can look to the Lord to show you what direction to steer the car. <clears throat> Sometimes illustrations can be very helpful to us. But I'm afraid I told that young brother rather bluntly, but nicely, because I knew him well. I said, addressing him by name, I said, you know, that is a bad illustration. It does not fit scripturally. Because God never tells us if we don't know which way to go, just to go somewhere. Do something, get active. No, he usually tells us to sit still and wait for the Lord to give us guidance. Sometimes we need a time alone with the Lord. Sometimes we need time to be simply in his presence to learn his mind. 
Could the Lord have given Paul and Silas that vision right away? Yes, he could have. But he chose simply to say, no, not that way. No, not that way. And it wasn't until they sat still in Troas for a few days, and we're not sure how long, that they got the vision that they needed. Now, I don't mean that you and I will necessarily get a vision as Paul did. Sometimes the Lord uses dreams and visions today, especially with people that do not know the Lord and really have a desire to know him. The Lord does use dreams and visions especially in lands where it's very difficult to get a hold of a Bible, very difficult to go to a gospel meeting, very difficult perhaps even to make contact with a believer who might tell you the gospel. And the Lord has ways of speaking in dreams and visions, and he still does that, and he did it in the Old Testament. But the Lord if the Lord wants to make his mind known to you, he can make it so very clear that you will have absolutely no question in your soul that it is the mind of the Lord. And so Paul and Silas got their guidance. Now I hasten to say that everything didn't go smoothly for them. Do you remember what happened when they went over to Macedonia? They ended up in a place called Philippi, and they first of all didn't meet up with any man. They met up with a group of women who were out there having prayer by a riverside, and they went and spent time with them, and they were there for quite a while. And the follow-up was that they ended up casting a demon out of a woman and ended up getting beaten and thrown in prison on account of it. And the man, the man I believe that was in question, was the jailer. And they had to go to prison in order to meet that man. That wasn't, I, I don't think that's what Paul and Silas were expecting. So God has his ways that we don't always understand. But nevertheless, he will show us his mind. Turn over now to Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> I enjoy this, these two verses particularly. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse... Well, let's read verse 7. Colossians 1 and verse 7. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. But then notice the ninth verse. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. <clears throat> May I suggest to each one of us that in these three verses, we have all three things that we have been talking about. We have on the one hand, the Spirit of God, in verse 8. In verse 9, we have the understanding of the will of God. And in verse 10, we have a closer. All three are tied together and you can't have any one of them without the other. It's very noteworthy, at least it is to me, that 
this is the only mention of the Spirit of God in the entire book of Colossians. And I'll tell you I, what I believe is the reason for that. Colossians focuses on Christ and on all that he is and all his glories. And in the first chapter, you get simply what Christ is. You get probably the highest truth about Christ himself in the first chapter of Colossians. Then in the second chapter, you get what Christ is to the church, a wonderful chapter. But the emphasis is on Christ. And so the Holy Spirit, we say it reverently, fades into the background in order that the glory of Christ might be before us. This is in contrast to Ephesians, where the Spirit of God is mentioned over and over and over again. Why? Because there it is our blessings and what we have in Christ and all that is ours in Christ. And those blessings, of course, and all that we have in Christ are made good to us and the enjoyment of them is given to us through the Spirit of God. And therefore, you have the Spirit mentioned over and over again in Ephesians. But here the Spirit of God is mentioned only once. And I have enjoyed the fact that it's mentioned, first of all, in connection with the desire, as it says in verse 9, that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. <clears throat> Wisdom has to do with the knowing the will of God. Spiritual understanding has to know with the direct application of the will of God to a particular circumstance. For example, I may have the wisdom to know that the Lord wants me to go in a certain direction in my life. But then there may be certain particular circumstances that he wants me to be involved in. I need day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute guidance by the Spirit of God. And I should be before the Lord, even about little things. Let me use an illustration. And I knew the man that told me this. A man was driving with his wife through a forested area, heavily forested, and there was a good road through it, but it was heavily forested. And in heavily forested areas, Maybe they don't have them as much as they used to, but they used to have what were called fire towers or ranger towers, which were very high towers built up higher than most of the trees in the forests. And at the top, there would be what was called a forest fire ranger who was up there with a view in all directions in order to keep an eye on the forests, he could see many, many miles up there and look out for any early beginnings of a forest fire. Because sometimes they can start spontaneously if the weather's very dry. All it takes is some lightning or something like that to start a forest fire. And something said to this man, I believe it was the Spirit of God, as he was driving through that forest there, he passed by a ranger's tower, and the Lord seemed to say to him, go up into that tower and give that man the gospel. And he kept on driving for another mile or two, and then he said, and he told me this story himself, he said, Lord, 
I am a disobedient servant. And he turned his car around, drove back, parked at the foot of the ranger's tower. He was relatively young at the time. Easily, he climbed up the ladder to the tower and knocked on the trap door. And when the ranger called out, who's there? He said, it's an evangelist with the word of God. <clears throat> Well, the ranger immediately pulled up the trap door and said, come in, come in. He said, you don't realize that I've been going through real turmoil in my soul about my life and where I'm going and my, my relationship with the Lord. And I've been hoping and waiting that someone would come along and help me. Come in and talk to me. <clears throat> And that man spent an hour with that ranger and was able to give him the gospel and was able to bring him to Christ. That's guidance. But you have to be willing to listen. You have to be walking with the Lord. You have to be wanting to speak to someone. And the Lord is willing to use any one of us Maybe it isn't the gospel that's before us. Maybe it's a decision we have to make. Which way to go? How to go this way? How to do that? Which job we should take? What kind of education we should get? If there's an opportunity, whom we should marry? Where we should live? Many, many big decisions in our lives but they require a close walk with the Lord. How do we get a closer walk with the Lord? Notice verse 10. And we could spend an hour on this, but we'll just spend a minute or two. Colossians 1 and 10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. A closer walk with the Lord means that I recognize that my life down here does not ultimately belong to me. The man of the world, the woman of the world says, I'm in charge of my own destiny. I want to live my life my way, do what I want to do, be what I want to be, get involved with what I want to get involved with. And don't anyone get in my way. Now, of course, as we well know, sometimes things don't work out. And many people in this poor world are very disappointed in their lives because things don't work out the way they would like. But for you and for me, it's not about us. It's about Christ. And as the scripture tells us, and this is in John chapter 12, you can turn to it. He that, that, he that loveth his life shall lose it. But he that loseth, hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If I'm willing to give up my life in this world and have a close walk with the Lord, I will find it is a happy pathway and I will find that the Lord will look after me too. And so, again, I say the only time in Colossians where the Spirit of God is involved and where he is mentioned is primarily in connection with, yes, it's, talk, it's talking about the love of God that's in our hearts for other believers, love in the Spirit, but I suggest that it's in connection with verses 9 and 10, with knowing the will of the Lord and with having a closer walk with him. <clears throat> well, our time is up. Uh, I'd just like to have a word of prayer. And then, as far as I'm concerned, I have some time so that if anyone on the call has a comment that he would like to make about the subject before us, they would be very welcome. 
anyone has a question that they would like to ask about what we were saying or about the subject, then uh, the way is open for that. But let's just have a short word of prayer. Our loving God and our Father, we thank thee for thy precious word and all that it gives us. And we thank thee that thou art willing to guide us, willing to lead us in the difficulties of the way through this world, ready to lead and guide us in thy way. But we know, our God, that thy way involves having a relationship with thee and walking with thee in truth and faithfulness, honoring thee in our pathway and seeking to be led by thyself. We pray that this may be more and more true of us, as we have read together, that we might walk worthy of thee, Lord Jesus, unto all pleasing, that we might know thee, to know thy will, and to be filled with the knowledge of thy will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So we commend ourselves to thee now and commit what has been said to thee, that it might be used for blessing. And we ask all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And the only thing I can say to that is that I believe that if the Lord chooses and remember in the believer's life, when we have the spirit of God, I don't believe that the Lord really uses dreams and visions so much today as he did back in the early days of the church. I believe today the Lord uses dreams and visions more with unbelievers who for various reasons don't have access to the scriptures or to another believer from whom they can hear the gospel. But the Lord, I believe, could still work that way in a believer's life. And in the Apostle Paul's case, and I would suggest that each one of you take the time to look them up, we find that there are seven distinctive visions in the life of the Apostle Paul. Beginning with the first one, that was the light from heaven that struck him down on the road to Damascus. But then, while he was without sight for three days in Damascus, evidently there was a vision where the Lord told him that a man by the name of Ananias would come in and meet with him and uh, would uh, cause him to have his sight restored and so on. Uh, and if you go through the life of Paul, you find that there were seven distinct visions. So Paul, I believe, was a special case. But even in the Old Testament, you'll remember, for example, that when uh, <clears throat> Pharaoh had a dream, the dream troubled him because there was something about that dream that convinced him that this was no ordinary dream. And he had two dreams, you'll remember, that Joseph interpreted, one concerning shocks of corn or wheat, and one concerning cattle. And the dreams were one and the same, so that the Lord gave Pharaoh two dreams to make, if we could say it this way, to make sure that he got the point. And what happened in the case of Nebuchadnezzar? He too had a dream. And something said to him, this is no ordinary dream. This is from the Lord, and you need to find out what it means. And so I would suggest that in your life and mine, if the Lord wants to bring something vividly before us, <clears throat> and we are walking with him, he will make it abundantly clear. 
sometimes we're not clear. And we find that in the case of a man like Gideon. Gideon, I don't believe, was concerned about the mind of the Lord so much as he was concerned that the Lord would use him. He figured he wasn't up to the task, up to the job. And so Gideon asks for a sign. And the Lord gave it to him twice over. And you can find that sign about, first of all, uh, making the fleece to be dry and everything all around or uh, <clears throat> fleece to be dry and everything all around would be wet and then the fleece to be wet and everything around would be dry and so on. I believe the order was really reversed but anyway the point is that Gideon got two signs the Lord made sure that he was convinced and sometimes people do ask for a sign in their lives and the Lord gives it to them. Let me use an illustration. I knew a brother one time who had a particular question in his life. And he was really convinced of the Lord that the Lord was in it. But he still didn't quite know. He just couldn't be sure. So he asked the Lord for a sign. And the Lord gave it to him. And then he asked the Lord for a second sign. And the Lord gave him another sign. And he said, oh, Lord, I'm convinced, Lord, thank you. And he went ahead. And so I believe sometimes the Lord, if he recognizes that we can have some doubts in our minds, but I believe if we're not totally sure, we can go to the Lord again and say, Lord, pardon my poor heart, but I'm still not totally sure. Can you, can you make this even more clear to me? And I believe he will because the Lord wants to make his mind known to us. And he recognizes our weakness. He recognizes our infirmity. So that would be my only comment on that. And I have, if I can use myself as an example, I have found out in my own life that when I was walking with the Lord and I really wanted to know his mind, he made it so clear that I had no, no doubt about it. On the other hand, let me make one more comment. Let's not go about boasting about it and telling other people. I have heard dear saints of God go about telling other people, well, I knew I had the mind of the Lord, so I just went ahead. Yeah, I knew the Lord was with me. The Lord showed me that this is what I should do. Oh no. That's boasting. That's grandstanding, as we say in English. That's really telling other people, I was walking so close to the Lord that I couldn't possibly have missed his mind. Don't do that, because that is fraught with danger. That is, in some cases, the voice of an individual who really isn't walking with the Lord as much as he thinks he is. And maybe then he's going to end up finding that it isn't the Lord's mind. And I have seen dear souls who were so convinced of having the Lord's mind and who went ahead in a pathway that others had questions about. And when they got into serious difficulties, they had to realize that the Lord wasn't with them. And it was, to say the least, very, very embarrassing because they had gone around telling other people that they were so sure that they had the mind of the Lord. So let's not boast about it. 
but we can have the confidence in our own soul that we do have the mind of the Lord and that confidence can give us to go ahead in the pathway that we feel he's led us into. Samuel was not used to hearing the voice of the Lord. And I think there may be a lesson for us that, uh, you know, a lot of times we come to a crossroads and all of a sudden we want to hear the voice of the Lord and we're, we haven't been used to listening for the the urgings of the Spirit of God in our life until then. And all of a sudden we're wanting a crash course on how to know the will of the Lord and and uh, we shouldn't be surprised that we're dull of hearing. But if we're walking in the Spirit, the Spirit, uh, you know, with John and uh, in the prophets, it's a voice behind saying, this is the way. And uh, a lot of times we're, we're not sensitive to that voice behind. And so we miss our way, but we have the advantage of the indwelling spirit of God. And we should uh, cherish that gift and make use of it because he is, he has the mind of Christ for us. He will lead us. He does not want us to go wrong. And a lot of times we, we really have in our mind, kind of as you suggested, Leonardo, uh, a certain course of things, and uh, and those our minds can reinforce that, and and it may, maybe we need to judge that, and get before the Lord and say, you know, this is my tendency, and I I really I really need you to to make it plain. This is not your will. If it's not your will, I don't I don't want to go in that direction and that needs to come from an honest heart doesn't it that we need to learn that is the lord's will is the path of blessing and so we need to fear our own will because it will be contrary uh to to our own happiness well that's very true very, very true, and uh, uh, a lot of things can crowd into our mind. Sometimes our bent of mind, our natural tendencies, and especially our culture can influence very strongly the way we think and the way we tend to go in a certain direction or want to go in a certain direction. And uh, sometimes it's very difficult for us. That's true. Um, do we have any clear guidance as to what God's will is uh, as to its purpose? Um, generally, I, I've always thought it would be for his glory and for the blessing of others. But more than that, I cannot say. Have you any thoughts on that, Bill? Only that. The Lord doesn't always reveal to us everything that is going to happen or what we're going to be doing. And I think a prime example is what we get with the Apostle Paul and, and Silas that we were talking about. All they heard in the vision, or all Paul heard, was the voice of the man from Macedonia saying, come over and help me? No, us. And the us was not explained. Paul had no idea he'd meet a group of women by a riverside. He had no idea that he would encounter uh, a woman possessed with a demon. He had no idea that he would end up in prison and would meet the, the Philippian jailer, and so on. So the Lord doesn't always reveal all that to us. Uh, sometimes he leads us only step by step. But in a general way, I believe uh, the Lord would show us uh, 
how he wants us to go and what he wants us to do. And he'll give us whatever intelligence we need at the time. But we sometimes have to wait to get the rest of the intelligence until we go forward. And so you see, for example, when Saul of Tarsus was arrested on the road to Damascus, and he says to the Lord, first of all, who art thou, Lord? And then he says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord didn't tell him everything. He says, arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. That's all the advice he got, all the light he got at that point. Go into the city and uh, you'll get further advice. And so I believe it's often the same in our own lives because that keeps us dependent, doesn't it? If we knew everything right from the beginning, we would say, well, I guess it's all marked out. I know what I'm going to be doing, where I'm going and why I'm going to be there. And no, the Lord doesn't always tell us that. 